Good afternoon, everyone. We continue to have guests join us, but in the interest of time and to get you to the great content we have planned, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Kelly Romanoff with the Charles and Marjorie Brancic Foundation. And today you've signed up for a wonderful webinar on how to save your organization money and take climate action. At the start of the webinar today, there's a poll that's been issued. And if you could kindly complete that poll, that'll help us assess who's on the call and, um, and move through our agenda today. I know with COVID, we are uh, on many Zoom calls and on many webinars, but I promise you that today's is really high quality. So I encourage you to please um, give as much undivided attention as you can to the panelists today. Um, it's all about our community and how we can take local action to support our climate change and resilience in our beautiful, beautiful Sarasota County and area, and also to help each of you as your agencies and small businesses learn and save money. Um, Brancic Foundation supports a, a range of issues in the community, but one of our big areas is environmental education and climate resilience. Um, the reasons we do that are numerous, but I thought the most appropriate um, was one that um, we used in my household growing up, and it was, when mom's happy, everyone's happy. And I believe that goes for Mother Earth too. So what we can each do to make our Mother Earth happy so that everyone can be happy is what we'll focus on today. You're gonna hear about local sustainability goals from our city and county leaders, examples of resource efficiency projects that are underway in Sarasota, why sustainability and efficiency should matter to you as a business owner. We'll get a great update from our partners at Florida Power and Light and then we'll end with plenty of time for question and answers. Moving us through our agenda today is Mark Gordon with the Business Observer. We appreciate Mark guiding us today and thank you all for being here. With that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Awesome, thank you, Kelly. Um, yes, uh, good point about uh, keeping mom happy, happy wife, happy life for sure. Um, I'm gonna go over the, uh, the panelists um, and speakers today. Uh, we have um, uh, Philip Tayville. Philip is president and CEO of Children First, where he has served in that capacity for over 24 years. He holds a master's in nonprofit organizations and a master of science in social administration. We also have Anon Pelagar. Anon is founder of Dream Large, leads a portfolio of successful companies and ventures driven by his personal life philosophy, which is wherever we are, whatever we do, we have a duty to serve our community. That mantra is the heartbeat of Dream Large, which is the first registered benefit corp in the region with a people over profit mindset. Uh, we also have Sarah Kane. Sarah is, has lived in Sarasota for 15 years and has worked in various environmental roles in, with Moat Marine Laboratory, the Sarasota Bay, Estuary program and has been with Sarasota County Sustainability for the last five years. We have Ray Dowling, uh, Area uh, Management Director, External Affairs Manager, responsible for Sarasota, Manatee, Highlands, Hardy, and DeSoto Counties for FPL. Ray is a nearly lifelong resident of Florida and has been a member of this community for 23 years. And we have Jeff Vrendenberg, who has been living in Sarasota for six years and working for City of City Sustainability of Sarasota for five years. So that is the panel. We also wanted to remind you guys, um, there'll be a Q&A box on the tab of your screen so you can ask questions. Um, and we'll, you will also get a PDF at the end of this through your email, which will go over some of the resources and ideas and concepts um, these panelists will be talking about. So to get started, um, I'm gonna go with Sarah who, um, Sarah, can you give us an overview of Partners for Green Places and how we got here? Yes, hi everyone, thank you, Mark. Happy to be here today. We actually started this project um, in 2018. So Sarasota County and the City of Sarasota sustainability staff approached the Charles and Marjorie Berancic Foundation and the Gulf Coast Community Foundation to apply for a Partners for Places grant. That's a grant that's given to local government sustainability staff and programs to work with local area foundations 
to advance our sustainability initiatives, policies, and goals with shared funding. We proposed a project to work with nonprofits to reduce their energy and water use in their buildings, and we received the grant that is funded by two national organizations, the Urban Sustainability Directors Network and the Funders Network for Smart Growth and Livable Communities. And it's matched by our local foundations. Our initial grant partnership grew into a much bigger sustainability and climate action movement that we're excited to talk about today. Now two other local foundations, the Community Foundation of Sarasota County and the William, and, William G. and Marie Selby Foundation have also provided us with support and additional funding. Also Dream Large has invested their expertise and vision into this initiative. The nonprofits have also been key players. They have received extensive energy and water audits from professional consultants that have provided them with an energy roadmap. The energy roadmap has recommendations for improvements and return on investment of utility savings through those upgrades. The 13 nonprofits are taking the savings they receive by reducing their bills and putting that money back into their programming, which serves environmental and human services nonprofits to improve the environment and serve underserved and low-income community members. Now we're sharing the story of these nonprofits to other sectors, including businesses, so that everyone can be a part of this local climate movement. We're here to give you tips today on how you can be a partner and join us by reducing your energy and water usage in your buildings and save money at the same time. Thank you. Excellent. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Jeff, you can give us, um, how does Partners for Green Places relate to the sustainability goals of the city and the county? Thanks, Mark. And yes, happy to be here. Um, Partners for Green Places is very much in line with both city and county goals that we've had for quite a long time. As for the city of Sarasota, we set our Ready for 100 goal in 2018. This goal set a course for 100% renewable energy community-wide by 2045, and even sooner than that, 100% renewable energy goal for city operations by 2030. We got there by engaging in a year-long community planning process that prioritized energy efficiency first. Guiding this was also our citywide comprehensive plan. This plan is an action strategy to implement programs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 35% by 2025 from 2003 levels. As for Sarasota County's goals, their Office of Sustainability was established by a 2002 resolution. So they've been at this for almost two decades. In 2005, they had their green building resolution encouraging energy efficiency with fast track permitting for certified green buildings in the community. And in 2006, they adopted a 2030 challenge resolution, which encourages, uh, encourages buildings to be carbon neutral by 2030. Lastly, Sarasota County also has a comprehensive plan updated in 2016. This is a policy to promote energy efficient buildings and infrastructure and the application of renewable energy strategies in both the public and private sectors. So as you can see, we've both been working on this for a long time and we're excited for this partnership and how it's changing the community. Thank you. Excellent, great. Thanks, Jeff. That's uh, some, some great work. And, and as Jeff talked about, when we're moving this into real, real life scenarios. Uh, Philip, with Children's First, you were one of the first pilot nonprofits for this project. Can you talk about your experiences there um, with, with this project? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, be pleased to. Um, uh, one, we were very happy to be invited to be one of the pilot projects along with uh, Historic Spanish Point and Harvest House. Uh, three nonprofits with really uh, widely divergent missions, uh, as well as uh, physical plant facilities. So I think uh, the project was able to see uh, and learn some very good lessons from it. Um, so this would be my stake in the ground for all of you who are watching and listening. Uh, this effort has allowed us to commit 
uh, not only more resources to mission through our savings, but has allowed us, and I'll reference back to Kelly, to be good stewards of our environment, to, to take care of Mother Earth. And here's how that worked out for us. After being selected as one of the nonprofits for the pilot, um, we uh, got together as a staff and determined of our facilities throughout Sarasota County, which would be the best um, uh, candidate for the, the energy roadmap. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. And we decided on our Northport facility, uh, which had been built and opened in 2007. Uh, we went through that because we looked at energy bills. We looked in essence at our cost per square foot for utilities and operating um, uh, our facilities. And once we made that selection, um, we spent a lot of time uh, uh, working with the consultant to develop the energy roadmap. That er energy roadmap really is uh, unlike any type of energy audit I had ever seen before. Um, extraordinarily comprehensive, uh, not only looking at um, uh, all the data that we provided in terms of uh, existing costs, past costs, uh, but getting down to a nitty gritty um, where they looked at literally every square inch of our building. They looked at the materials that were used in building it. And in getting that energy roadmap, it identified all of the things that I've just spoken about, uh, but more importantly, it identified really excellent suggestions as to how we could move ahead and make our best investment through uh, the grant in becoming, again, um, better stewards of the environment by saving money and, and supporting our mission. So the decision that we made was based on a matrix that they gave us that spoke about um, low investment, low return, low investment, high return, that continuum, high investment, low return, high investment to high return became very easy in essence in uh, an at a glance format to say this is where we best put our money and what we did was to replace air conditioning units that were about 14 years old and um, were not particularly efficient when the building was opened um, let me sort of give you a bottom line on that uh, tracking from november to date uh, we have saved 37 percent in our electrical costs uh, because of those AC units. Um, that's really significant. Uh, it's a 10,000 square foot building, uh, external classroom doors, they're open and closed all the time, kids going to the playground, that sort of thing. So we're, we're hugely pleased with being able to knock uh, uh, over a third off of our electric bills. Uh, we did some other things there, such as um, weather stripping, uh, putting aerators on all of the faucets, uh, might be hard to imagine, but when a child washes uh, her hands at the sink or his hands at the sink, they might leave it running for a while until the teacher gets to it. So um, uh, it's lots of little things uh, uh, ranging from the little screen aerators that screw on to AC units. Um, here are some additional benefits that we were able to derive out of this project. We were not to the same extent, but able to take that energy roadmap and look at our other facilities and begin doing some assessments again of um, what type of investments might we make, uh, what are the uh, uh, low cost, high reward, which was easy, weather stripping doors, for instance, if they hadn't been or replacing that weather stripping. Um, what were the high cost with the high reward? And the reason that that was important is it allowed us to develop basically a multi-year capital budget so that we would be able to uh, work towards whether it was through private philanthropic efforts uh, or grant opportunities um, to make those high cost investments knowing that we would lower our operating costs. Uh, one of the things that I can share and I saw that there were a preponderance of nonprofit folks logging in um, is there are many donors who are extraordinarily interested in this area. And I believe uh, all of us nonprofits that are uh, uh, active in terms of our philanthropic efforts have a very good opportunity to make the case that that investment allows us, again, to support mission more fully, uh, particularly over the long term. 
um, it's, it's really been great for us. And what we've done is to develop that long-term, in essence, capital needs uh, around uh, being able to improve uh, our energy efficiencies, uh, even up to the point where we have discussion of expansive uh, solar uh, photovoltaic uh, field uh, on one of our buildings that has a very large roof and a, a good exposure and we could greatly reduce our cost. It's an ambitious goal, but something that we're looking towards. Um, it, it's, it's really been terrific, and I'll finish with this by telling you that um, it's not just these technical things that I've been describing. Uh, we have been able to draw our staff and the families that we serve into this. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been able to uh, tell our staff about these investments. We've been able to encourage them uh, to do those simple things at home, such as weather stripping, such as aerators on their faucets, uh, changing their air filters more frequently on their air conditioners. And even more importantly, uh, the families that we serve live below the federal poverty level. And we've carried this message forward to them as well and we've given them guidance because we know, like for all of us, uh, every dollar that we save, uh, uh, in essence, from an unnecessary expense, allows us to support those things that are really most important. Um, I'd finish with where I began. This is really um, a wonderful project. It's about uh, energy savings. It's about efficiencies. Um, but really what it is, it's a, it's a mission-based project. And for that, we are grateful to have been selected as a pilot and to have been a participant. Thanks all so much. Thanks, Philip. Um, that's really great to show the, the real savings. I think that's what a lot of people are interested in is those, those risks and, and rewards. That's, that's fantastic. Moving on to Anon. Um, Anand Pelagar, um, you've also been part of this from the beginning. Um, tell us about the P4 GP model. How do you apply it to your business and all the entities that you have in, in Sarasota? Sure thing, Mark. Thanks. Thank you. As Philip said, you know, this is a mission-based model. And I think that that is really speaks to the truth of it. For me personally, um, I'm a huge advocate for shifting the narrative from just a conversation about the climate crisis into actually doing something and hopefully driving societal transformation. If you look back, this initiative was created with the intent to inspire a collective of organizations and businesses to forge a commitment in partnering towards a greener future. And the goal was to drive this systematic change across our community by using energy assessment as a tool and helping organizations, nonprofits, the pilots that Philip referenced, understand and adapt towards a more sustainable energy future. And, and that's really where Dream Large stepped in and played a role. You know, as the first benefit corporation in the Gulf Coast, we saw an opportunity to drive that broader vision and use it as an opportunity to educate, to inspire, and get the community to understand what the micro steps are that they could use to, you know, shift this climate uh, debate into actually action. You know, when you look at us as a small business, we're small businesses, you know, we ultimately create two thirds of the new jobs. We drive innovation and we drive competitiveness in the US economy. We are ultimately, you know, the disruptors. And every small business, every large business ultimately starts as a small business. So I think it's, it's a cultural shift that, you know, we saw the opportunity to create and where the change can really take foot is in the small business climate. For us, you know, as a portfolio of companies, you know, we tend to love uh, old buildings and they create some huge issues when it comes to sustainability. Um, you know, in Florida, we're so quick to demolish an old structure and put up something new. For us, we like to preserve them. We love the stories they tell, the history they contain, and you know, in in doing so, it creates challenges. However, you know, Philip talked about one key thing that he saw 30% saving from, which was with AC. Um, what we have realized is that by taking micro changes as opposed to trying to do macro things, we can achieve significant cost savings. Some of those things include using smart thermostats. 
uh, to share another statistic, we took a 1926 building and did two things. We painted the roof white, which helps reflect heat, you know, from a typical black asphalt roof, um, shingle roof. And we uh, put in smart thermostats. Typically, most employees will set a thermostat to whatever their preference is, and they most often leave on a Friday and leave it for the weekend. Those two actions, in effect, saved us over 50% of our energy costs, and it was just those two things. We also introduced LED lights throughout all our facilities. They all use LEDs, and you know those very small things in buildings that can't really be insulated well um, have created a transformational shift in energy savings for us. Um, I think that for us, it's really about setting that culture painting that vision up front and making sure everyone's on board of it. And that's ultimately, you know, how we've applied it to ourselves. Yeah, that, that's great. You, you've definitely done a lot with it. And how have you seen it, Anon? How have you seen this initiative and project um, sort of evolve over the years as, as your companies have evolved as well? Sure. So, I mean, it's, it's incredible to see such a diverse group of organizations come together and unify around a singular cause. I mean, that right there tells you how important it is, both to the foundations, but also to the nonprofit community. And I think for us, you know, it has been an incredible achievement to watch the city, the county, and all of these groups, you know, and the private sector to ourselves kind of engage around this topic. You know, while it started with the nonprofit sector and those initial pilot organizations, the ultimate change is going to come out of the private sector because that's where the critical mass is. And I think that the opportunity for us to educate, inspire, and, and, and for the private sector to ultimately understand there are things that they can do, whether it's these micro things, if, if they do composting, some of the things we discussed earlier, there is so much that they can do themselves, but together we can ultimately drive that change collectively. And, you know, I think the biggest misconception I think most people hold is that, you know, the environment, you know, hope is that someone else is gonna address that problem. And the reality is that every single one of us holds a key to doing it. It isn't a massive problem. It isn't an unscalable challenge. It takes every single one of us to take those micro decisions and think about it, but I think more importantly to educate and set a, a culture around how we look at the environment and what are the steps that we're taking. And you know, some of the things that I've been really inspired by by the nonprofit by the nonprofit foundations in the community are they're starting to look at what is the policy, the environmental policy of organizations before they give out a grant. I know we do that at Gulf Coast. Um, I'm on the board there, and, and I think it's a very important foundational block to say that, look, this is important, we measure it, we're paying attention to it, so start making those changes. In the same vein, we need to do the same things in the private sector. Um, and ultimately, the goal of PGP is to share those stories. So if you have an innovative story, if you have something that you think is cool that you're doing, we want to hear about it because we want to share it with the rest of the PGP and broader community, because if we can make this change here in Sarasota and we can get other communities to look at what we've done and perhaps think about how they could adopt it into their backyards, that's transformational, you know, and it, and it ultimately started right here uh, in our community. That's what I would love to see happen. Excellent, really good points about, about individual businesses working together to build that goal. Um, switching on to Ray Dowling with FPL, uh, you know, Ray, FPL is, is such a key partner in all these programs. Um, what does FPL offer uh, to businesses uh, that want to be involved in this? Thanks, Mark. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. And I will tell you that uh, both Philip and Anad have uh, stolen some of my thunder, some of the things that I, you know, that we like to talk about all the time, they're doing and putting into practice. And it's really great to hear um, the results that, we're see that they are seeing. Um, some of the resources that we have, certainly the, the, the fastest and easiest one is just go to fpl.com uh, forward slash business and there's a, a plethora of information there. Um, you can also, we have business energy experts um, that come into your home or business 
uh, or I should say business or home or even nonprofit to do, um, to talk to you about how you can save money. You can um, email them at bee at fpl.com or you can always call 800-375-2434 and uh, talk to a business energy expert. Philip talked a lot about um, replacing his air conditioning and, and that is absolutely the biggest user of electricity. And I always like to tell people the best way to save on your bill or to save electricity is to save money is to not use it. Um, and when you have a more efficient uh, elect uh, air conditioner, you're not using a lot of electricity that you were wasting on an old system. Um, you know, in the summertime, especially when it's so hot outside, uh, our air conditioning costs make up between 40 to 70 percent of your bill and throughout the year it's at least 50 percent of your bill so like like Philip talked about saving 38 percent on his electric bill just because of replacing an air conditioner can be can be excuse me could be significant um, some other things if you're not going to replace your air conditioner it might not be um, uh, time to do that but you can avoid some cost by not cooling places that are underutilized. Um, in this day and age with not having so many people in our buildings, um, maybe you have a lobby or a conference room or a break room that could not be um, cooled quite as normally as you might have in the past. Uh, for every three, for, excuse me, for every degree that you raised your air conditioning, um, you can save about 3% on your cooling costs. That's a kind of a rule of thumb. A non talked about uh, programmable thermostats. Absolutely. When you're not in your, if you're not in your space, uh, you go home for the weekend, uh, even in the evening time, you forget to turn the air conditioner up. Um, if you've got a programmable thermostat, you don't even have to think about it. And just as an FYI, we recommend that um, in unoccupied spaces that you actually raise your air conditioning temperature to 82 degrees. Um, other easy kind of things to do, especially depending on your exposure to the sun, is to use window shades or blinds to reduce your um, uh, the heat and the um, uh, to receive some savings on, on your air conditioning. Another uh, resource for you is ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. Their website is www.ashray.org. Um, they have a, a lot of information um, there. Some of the other programs that we have, and I've sent this to, um, to Sophia. We have a, a pamphlet out there that can give you some information. She'll be forwarding to you. but. Um, we do offer business energy evaluations. Um, all of these programs that we have, you know, you really want to start with an evaluation to see, like Philip talked about, where you can get uh, high reward for the investments that you're making. You can also do one online. It's on our website. Um, we do offer um, a credit on your bill every month if you are on on call, business on call. Um, all of the information with regards to these programs is in the pamphlet that you'll get. Also, too, we offer rebates for lighting. Um, we offer rebates for direct expansion air conditioning units, um, thermal energy storage for some pot potentially bigger ones, um, bigger units, um, bigger businesses that require chillers um, for their buildings. We also offer rebates. And we have a business custom incentive um, where we can help if you've got a, an investment that's um, going to save quite a bit of money, we may be able to do some custom rebates for you. So that's some of the programs that we have. Again, those resources, fpl.com forward slash business, uh, business energy evaluation, or excuse me, bee -E at fpl.com and a phone number 800-375-2434. Excellent. Those are some great resources, Ray. And, and sticking with you and FPL, um, because I, I think this sort of brings back the curtain a little bit, and a lot of business owners and nonprofit executives would want to know this. What are demand rates, and how does that affect um, monthly charges um, for, for clients, customers? So demand, um, it's how much electricity you're using at any given moment. Um, most um, businesses, if you're larger, the single family homes just have a regular meter. 
Um, if you might be just have a small office, you might have a regular um, watt uh, meter, but uh, if you've got any size to your building, and uh, you probably have a demand meter, and these demand meters track and record the highest 30 minute level of electricity demand for each billing period. So, you, and your demand is measured in kilowatts, while your total electricity is measured in kilowatt hours. Um, I'm going to give you two examples um, here just to kind of put it in, in perspective. So you've got two customers that both use about 20,000 kilowatt hours over a course of a month. Um, and I'm not sure what, what Philips was, but I wouldn't say that that was probably out of the question. Um, the first customer uses a constant or steady amount of electricity over that period, while the second customer may use um, about that that same 20,000 kilowatt hours in bursts over a few hours or a few days of the month. Um, that's probably because of some equipment that they have or maybe they've done something different with their air conditioner. So although both of those customers use the same amount of electricity, that second customer would be charged more for placing greater demand on the system during that short periods of time when their electrical uses or demand peaked. So you kind of sometimes hear that. Um, one example that I like to, to, to equate it to is it's like driving a car. So those drivers that gun it or to get around another driver or they may be quick off the start line at a, at a, at a traffic light, they use more gas or energy when um, then somebody who just drives a steady pace and just takes off normally. So that's kind of what demand is. And so at the gas pump, you're using more electricity and it's the same type of thing um, with electricity. So what you wanna do to not peak your demand is to, especially um, if you've got multiple air conditioning units that, that draw a lot of electricity to get them started and get things cooled down, is to not start that equipment all at the same time. Um, if you've got two stagger, if they've both been off or, or whatever, don't have them start at the same time. Try to spend, allow, you know, some time in between 30 minutes or, or so apart. And that would go also for any large refrigeration that you might have or water heaters, things like that. You wanna kind of stagger the starts of those high demand appliances um, so that you don't peak the demand. Excellent, that's really good information. Thank you, Ray. Um, mm -hmm. As a non-mentioned and some others, um, you know, I'm gonna bring um, Sarah and Jeff back in. And as a non-mentioned, it's, it's, you gotta get started and, and think about it individually. Um, so Sarah and or Jeff, what are ways that businesses could easily save money on their utility bill? And where, where do they start, you know, go from being overwhelmed to starting on this? Great, right, yeah. So we've heard a lot of really good examples so far from Philip and Anand and Ray that you can implement at home or in your business or nonprofit. I really like how Philip talks about the simple things that their staff have been trained to do and that they've been training their clients to do at home. So you can actually start with modifying your behaviors and your operations to conserve water and energy. You can implement no and low costs or those low hanging fruit items uh, like making maintenance and operation changes. So for example, I know we've heard about some of these things already, but I'm gonna reinstate them. Um, you can turn off your lights when you're not in the room, set the thermostats to use um, as much energy when you're not there, so less energy when you're not there. I'm using smart thermostats. You can change your AC filters on a regular basis and have a regular maintenance schedule for your HVAC uh, systems and other items within your building. And you can uh, do a low cost item like changing out your lighting to LED bulbs. Uh, because these projects and behavior changes are low or no cost, they will actually save a lot and have the greatest impact and highest return on investment for your energy and water savings. And you can start them right away. Excellent, great. Um, but from the roadmaps, what, were, what are some of the common themes from roadmaps that, that you feel like have the greatest return on investment? 
Yeah, so I talked about the low hanging fruit, the, those behavior changes that you can make. Those are actually the highest return on investments because they're low cost and don't really cost you anything. But um, you can also do some more investment type cost items that can make a really big difference in the long run. Um, you can change your operating procedures and make those maintenance changes. Um, out of the, the roadmaps that we have seen so far for our nonprofits, um, some of the upgrades that they are making that has the highest ranking uh, return on investment are the LED lighting and retrofits and having LED lighting sensors. Also sealing the building envelope by fixing leaks, by copying weather stripping and sealing any penetrations. Also uh, water savings can come from faucet aerators and low flow faucet upgrades. Uh, also the programmable Wi-Fi thermostats uh, that we, some of um, Philip and Anon had mentioned. Uh, repairing or replacing your HVAC or air conditioning system ducts um, and smart plugs. And some other things that you can do that are medium to low return on investment um, because they're a little bit more costly, but they are an investment that you can do to save a lot of money over the long run. Um, is upgrading your HVAC units, like Philip mentioned, that was a huge savings for them. Upgrading your water heaters, insulation upgrades and repairs, solar window films, and upgrading your windows and doors. Excellent, great. And this has been brought up a couple of times, but in general, what are some resources, Sarah, that are available for businesses to get started uh, on these sustainability measures? Yeah, so first of all, uh, like we mentioned before, we do have a resource guide handout that Sophia is gonna email to everyone that participated in this webinar afterwards. So you'll get that and it has links to help guide you to take action on reducing your energy and water consumption and start saving money. Um, you can also take one of our classes that we have here at the Extension Office. Uh, we have an energy upgrade class um, that you can take online and you can get a free do-it-yourself energy saving kit. Um, and you can use that either in your home or your business. Um, you can also check out a do-it-yourself energy and water audit kit that we have free and available to everyone through our local Sarasota County libraries. And you can actually check that out. And it has a kilowatt meter in it and a guide and you can start learning um, how to save energy and water at home and measure your energy usage um, in your building. If you are a business in Sarasota County, you can participate in our Green Business Partnership Program. It's a free program managed by our waste reduction agent, Randy Penn. Um, Randy can sit down with you and consult with your business to give you some tips on how to save energy and reduce waste within your business. And then you can uh, become a partner, apply to become a partner, and you can get some tips. You can um, get your organization, your business recognized on our website and have some resources available for you there. Also, if you're a business or a nonprofit, you can consider getting a free FPL business energy evaluation that Ray mentioned earlier, that B evaluation that we're gonna share with you. Um, you can also hire a firm to get a detailed energy audit for your building, just like we did with the nonprofits to get our energy roadmap. You can hire a consultant that can give you that detailed energy roadmap, and they'll give you projects of uh, projects that you can upgrade on your building and an itemized report of how much energy you're going to save and how much money you're going to save and how much water you're going to save. Um, it'll show your return on investments of all of the projects and that you can implement right away or long-term. It's a really valuable item to have um, to look at those short-term and long-term savings and plan um, and budget. You can take the money that you're gonna be saving from making these upgrades to expand your business or your programs if you're a nonprofit. Also on the resource guide, definitely check out um, some financing options that we have on there like Property Assess Clean Energy or PACE program. It's a tool for property owners, including businesses, to finance private property improvements related to renewable energy, so solar, energy efficiency, and hurricane hardening through assessments levied on your property tax bill. So you can get 
a new roof, windows, solar, or energy efficiency upgrades financed through that program. Uh, we also encourage, we, we do encourage energy efficiency measures like we've been talking about today and behavior changes as a first step to save energy and water in your buildings, but we also encourage you to use renewable energy through solar PV. Um, to, we, we basically want everyone to offset the rest of your building energy use and become carbon neutral if you can, if you can invest in it. It's a great investment. Um, there are a lot of solar resources on the guide that we're going to be sharing with you, um, including the FPL Solar Together program that you can find out more from Ray about. And there's also going to be a solar co-op in Sarasota County this fall and again in 2021. So check out Solar United Neighbors website on the guide for more information about that. Um, and always feel free to contact us. We're here for you both uh, Jeff and I and Sophia with the city and the county. Um, we're here to answer any questions that you might have. Um, and all, all of our partners are here to share their stories as well. So thank you all for, for helping and sharing your stories with us today. Awesome, really great uh, resources and examples, Sarah, thank you. Um, we're gonna move on. We got a couple of really interesting questions to, to bring in that I think are going to shine a, a brighter light on some of these issues. And I think the first one is probably something that, that a lot of people think about and have conversations about. It's from Charles C. Reif. And Ray, I think you're the best person to start answering this and maybe Sarah and Jeff can, can jump in. Uh, the question is, I know of several nonprofits who were excited about putting up solar panels after optimizing efficiency but were discouraged by a confusing demand tariff structure that made payback periods very long. How do you understand the tariff and somehow neutralize the economic disincentive? Sorry, I thought I had unmuted it. Um, I, I think probably, I, I don't know the, the demand tariff um, problem there, but I do know that with regards to the just the overall rates of FPL, because our rates are so low, um, our rates are the, one of the lowest in the state of Florida, or some of the lowest to, in the southeast, and and well below the national average as far as electric rates go. Um, it's it's very hard, as I understand it, to cost justify the solar because the solar is still. Um, somewhat expensive. Um, as the cost of solar comes down, um, then you'll you'll be able to see um, a, a, a better uh, return and, and easier economics for the residential. I know at the utility itself, um, as uh, Sarah talked about, we do offer solar together, which is an, uh, an opportunity for you to su subscribe to solar that, that we generate um, and we've been able to generate electricity via solar because of the cost of solar coming down and because of the um, economies of scale that we get by building so much solar. Um, the, the Solar Together program is a, a subscription where you actually can choose to um, uh, up to 100% of your energy usage you can get from solar uh, through Florida Power and Light by paying a fixed monthly subscription charge with your monthly bill. And immediately what you get is you start to get a, a credit that reduces that subscription rate. And over time, um, that credit actually is greater than the subscription, thus lowering your, um, uh, your bill. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to, if you've got specific questions or a specific example, of, of a problem, Charles. I'm happy to, to talk about that um, offline. And if you don't just, mind, I might jump in here quick too, Mark. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Ray. But I, I, uh, I just wanted to, to also point out that although we see a lot about solar in the news and it seems like it's as quick as going out and buying a new refrigerator, it is a decision that um, can be a little bit technical to understand. And so I would highly encourage anybody that is interested in this to contact a local solar installer. They'll come out, they'll talk to you about your specific site, how the sun might interact with your roof angles, 
and they could they could write up a quote and talk to you about the tariffs, the possible tax incentives, because this really is something that they have quite an expertise in and they can help you understand it. And we have seen a lot of businesses locally and in Florida choose solar because it can make sense over the long term. So I wouldn't be discouraged. Um, and if you need help, like Sarah said, uh, reaching out to city or county or, or FPL, we can we can help direct you in the right direction. I would agree. Thanks, Jeff. Excellent. And, and on that point, uh, Ray, a quick follow up that Charles asked, won't the solar together program, will it be bad for local local solar providers and rob them of market opportunities? Um, I think, uh, I mean, I, I can't say for sure, but um, I think where, where we're trying to go to is there are a number of people that would like to do solar, um, put solar on their roof for their business, but it just doesn't make sense for them. For example, they may not own the home, but they would like to get their energy from solar, or they may have some um, tree issues that, or they may not have enough roof space. So really, this is an opportunity for customers who can't do it on their own um, because of all kinds of different reasons to still enjoy the benefits of solar. And as Anand said earlier, you know, doing a, a little bit to, to try to um, use renewable energy. Excellent, that's really great, very helpful. Um, uh -huh. Next question. Just one thing on the, yeah, on go the ahead solar is, I do think as businesses and or as homeowners, you've got to really think solar through from a time scale horizon. If you think about a solar investment, it's a 30 year investment that you're going to amortize over that period. And so I do, you know, I always like to throw caution to the wind with respect to solar. You've got to make sure your roof is up, to, up is going to hold that period of time. And also when you think about some of these uh, power purchase agreements, you know, you're, you're potentially saddling the future sales value with a debt that, you know, has got to be reconciled when you try and sell a piece of real estate that has sold around. So I do think, you know, you've got to weigh those into the conversation, you know, whenever you talk to a solar company and, you know, someone's trying to tell you how you could do solar on your roof the industry in the private sector is still a little bit like the wild, wild west. There are a few, you know, trusted players out there, but there's a lot of people stepping into it, no expertise um, and no real, you know, track record of success. And you've got to be really careful with solar because one mistake can be costly to an exorbitant degree of having to re-roof a house and do more. So I'm speaking from experience. <laughs> Excellent, that's important. And um, n next question, and, and similar issue, but a big picture question. I think Sarah and maybe Ray, really anybody can answer this, but it's from Linda Enberg, um, who asks, as a nonprofit planning to build a new energy efficient building, are you, are you aware of grants, local or national, available to support this kinds of brick and mortar project? So um, the Marie Selby Foundation um, does have grants available for building uh, improvements for nonprofits. So you might want to check into that. That's the first one that pops into my head. But if anyone else has any ideas, including any of the foundations, um, feel free to chime in. Okay, that is a good specific answer. Um, another question from Solar United Neighbors number one, or it could be hashtag one. Um, uh, Ray, specifically for you and FPL, do nonprofit customers have a choice of rate plans? Uh, rate plans are designed based on the usage. Um, so it, it all depends on what equipment that you have. Uh, all customers are treated, treated exactly the same, whether they're nonprofit, for-profit, low income, um, with regards to the, uh, the rates, it's just a, and it's all based on what your usage is. Um, if you've got a, a high demand with regards to big equipment and things like that, you need a different electricity coming into that um, point, of, uh, point of service. So, and the rates are based on that. So there's not anything specific with regards to nonprofits. 
We do offer a time of use rate, but um, time of use uh, here in Florida um, and those rates, uh, what we find, and again, I just have to go back to the, the, um, the, the low cost, the, the low rates that we have. Most people don't find it cost effective to uh, change their habits um, for, to um, take advantage of those um, time of use rates. And what they find is that it's um, essentially the same as um, just the regular rates that we have. Okay, excellent. Um, Ray, you're, you're the popular person here for questions. <laughs> I got, we got one more for you. Um, I think this is time for one more question. Um, it comes from uh, Project 180. Project 180 is considering using uh, GAF solar shingles in our roof replacement as part of our PGP grant. These cost significantly more than the regular asphalt singles we included in the estimate we submitted in our grant package, um, in addition to the P4GP grant, are the grants available that can help support this additional cost? I think that's probably really a, a question for possibly Sarah or the um, or Kelly with regards to uh, grants available for that additional cost. Um, uh, we do not have any type of a rebate for any type of uh, solar shingle um, or any type of, of roofing. Uh, um, on a building. Hi, this is Kelly. I just put my email in the chat box. If anyone has questions um, or is looking for funding for the project at this time, Brantwick Foundation does not have like a set aside pot to fund, but we um, actively take grant applications. We're continuing to find new funds to continue this energy and efficiency work. So email me. Um, we can talk through your specific project, see if there's something that might exist or how you could position yourself down the road to, to find additional funding. Thank you, Kelly. I'll just add that um, we are going to be considering some solar projects for the current Partners for Green Places uh, recipients. So um, I think you had probably already received a little bit of information about that, but we are going to be looking at that again as um, a solar, and there's going to be an application for possible solar for some of our partners, current partners. Excellent. And as um, said in the beginning, you all will be getting a uh, PDF and packet after this. Um, probably ha it will have contact information as well. Um, we just get it. We do have another question. Um, Sarah, this could be for you to start uh, from Mark Pritchett. How well is the local Solar United neighborhood co op program working? Yeah, so uh, we've had two. Um, yeah, two solar co-ops in Sarasota so far, and I can definitely um, get you more information on that and the contact there, but we're, the city and the county and other um, local nonprofits and organizations are working with Julia right now, who is our uh, local solar to get our solar <laughs> United Neighbors partner for the solar co-ops. And I think we've had a really good um, turnout for the solar co-op so far, and there's gonna be a couple more coming, thanks to you, Mark, and uh, the Gulf Coast Community Foundation, who I believe is, is funding some of that, so. Excellent, thanks, Sarah. I'm yeah. gonna turn it, um, that's it for questions. I'm gonna turn it over to John Thaxton, um, who's gonna talk about some action items and things we can do looking forward. I don't know if he's gonna talk about how he has the greatest quarantine beard. I will leave that up to John. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mark, for uh, calling attention to that. I'm not going to speak uh, about my uh, COVID-19 beard, um, but I have the um, easy job of the day, and that is just on behalf of the Gulf Coast Community Foundation, the Charles and Marjorie Baranzik Foundation, uh, thanking everyone for their participation. Um, I would like to thank Tom for his excellent job of moderating and our incredible panelists, Anand, Sarah, Philip, Ray, and Jeff for their insightful contributions. Thank you to you all. Um, I know your days are busy and at these times unpredictable, so we sincerely appreciate the time that you've taken with us this afternoon. Um, a reminder, this uh, Partners for Green Places initiative uh, was made possible by a grant from the Funders Network um, and additional funding by uh, Charles Marjorie Bransick Foundation, Gulf Coast Community Foundation of Sarasota County, William G. and Marie Selby Foundation, and additional support from Dream Large, US, UF ISIS, ITIS, 
extension and the city and county. So you can see this is a true community uh, collaborative. It has been very successful, um, both in the public sector, the private sector, the not-for-profit sector, um, and the nonprofit sector. Um, we do understand the pressing needs of COVID-19, uh, but we also remind you of the pressing needs of our planet. Um, and the needs of, our, of those that are most impacted by the pandemic are being met by the Partners for Green Places initiative by, as you heard, reducing their energy and utility costs and assisting those not-for-profits that provide for valuable service. So we encourage you to stay involved, become a partner, in the Partners for Green Places uh, movement. You will be receiving some handouts and some additional information. And finally, I'd like to leave you with three action steps that you can take. Number one, uh, learn more. Um, take a Green Partner business course or energy upgrade class that are available in the community and seek out other opportunities to learn more about energy and water efficiencies. Second, get an audit. Florida Power and Lights business energy evaluation is available and and there's also numerous um, professionals in the community that provides for these audits and we'd be happy to get you the information um, the contact information to get the audit and finally like Anand and Philip share your story uh, become a leader become a partner for green places that concludes this webinar we hope that it was useful and on behalf of my co-host uh, Kelly Romanoff and myself we again thank you for your participation.